today. There are a couple of things I want to say about the service today, a couple of changes uh, that you may want to heads up on. One is, if you look at the uh, children, it says children's sermon, uh, it says children's sermon and Lord's prayer. This is because I asked the session and they gave permission for me to do the Lord's prayer at the end of the children's sermon with their prayer rather than after the children have left because it's my belief that the children to learn that prayer and the way for them to do it is to be in worship uh, when we say it together. So they can join in during the children's prayer uh, when it comes to the Lord's prayer. The other thing that you may have noticed is very classy candles uh, up front. The, uh, the wicks, I guess, have gotten so short that, that they don't reach the oil, and so they, they wouldn't light. So other people came up with a substitute for this Sunday until uh, Matt is back, I guess, whoever changes the oil. Uh, uh, the office is closed tomorrow because it's a national holiday. And I, I want to let you know that also the Secretary, Erica, has taken a personal day on the food, but she won't be in this week until Wednesday. So if there's someone who would like to volunteer to come in and sit in the office for a while on Tuesday and answer the phone, that would be good. You can speak to me after worship uh, at, some, at some point. This is, as you probably know by now, especially if you've read the bulletin, um, my first Sunday officially as your interim pastor. Was on Tuesday, the session uh, devoted to uh, calling me to be the I've been telling people that the only reason I would consider this position is because it would be my only opportunity ever to be Linda's boss. <laughs> <laughs> and so that probably won't work out that way. <laughs> Actually, I am delighted because this is a wonderful congregation and a church with tremendous attention. And uh, I do need to be uh, forward to working with you uh, throughout the coming year. Uh, I I do want to make a disclaimer. I want to make sure everyone is aware that I confess uh, that I am awful with names. Okay, I've been around this church for a while, and I know many of your names, but there's many of you whose names I don't know, and some I should know, and I can't remember because I'm not good at remembering names. I will try. But please, bear with me. I want to get to know you. I want to get to know your names and who you are. So please, uh, I look forward to the opportunity to meet with each and every one of you and uh, getting to know you much better over the coming weeks and uh, months. Are there any other announcements that will come before the church before we begin? If not, then let us work it out.
Now let us join together in our responsive call to the peace. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Turn my heart to your decrees and not to selfish shame. Turn my eyes from looking at vanity. Give me light in your way. Confirm to your servant your promise. Turn away the disgrace that I dread, for your ordinances are good.
hear God's word of absolute and total forgiveness, but let it sink down into your very being. Indeed, friends, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Amen. Amen. Yeah. They ended up in slavery, that's right. They yeah. each made a 
country better. But George Washington was the first president, and Abraham Lincoln was the second You guys, you guys. Are so good presidents. They did things that really, really helped our country, and people want to remember them and aspire to be like them. Do you know why? Can you think of anything George Washington did? He fought in the country. Yeah, he, he, helped, he helped us have our country. Can you think, and we, somebody's already mentioned one of the things that Abraham Lincoln did helped get rid of slavery. They were good men. They were good presidents in part because they were good human beings. They were good people. They were good from the time they were little all the way to the top. And that's, do you think that's an important trait for a president to have to be a good person? To care for what's important for all the people in the country. Both of them did that. And, and we remember them and respect them because of that. Now God, does God only want a few of us who might be president one day to be good people? No. Does God want you to be a good person? Yeah. God wants all of us to be good people. And guess what? All of you can be a very, and probably are, a very good person. And you could be President of the United States one day. Did you know that? You knew that? Yeah. One of you. But you would have to be a very good person. Okay? So that's what we want for, for our President. And that's what God wants for all of us. For all of us to be the kind of people who people will be able to remember and think highly of once we're born. Okay, can we stand up and have a prayer? Let's stand up and join hands. And I'm going to end with the Lord's Prayer and the congregation's going to join in with us. And you can join in too. Can we join, join hands in a circle? I'm going to have to I'm going to have to hold this so you can just stand right here dear God we thank you for these children this morning we know that they have a week off at least some of them do for school from school and we pray for their safety this coming week and for their rest and leisure time we ask your blessing upon them and upon this church and pray for those who help to teach them about you and your love. And we pray that all of us would remember to be good people all the time. And all of this we pray in Jesus' name who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, and we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, you can go to your classrooms.
My sister in law has been to investigation because I'm going to tell her she's here. You're Kathy and your sister's Catherine? No, it's correct, he's all married Catherine. The Bart family on the on the sun is definitely Bart and uh Apple Bart. Apple Bart. Do you mean Kenzo Sodiac on the breaking of both elbows when she fell? Yeah, she Sodiac, I know you most of you know, fell and broke both of her elbows. All right, anybody else? Still many. Yes, Lenny Deal. Please remember, she's in the bulletin, but please remember. Yes, I am. Thank you, Tom recovering from back surgery. Tom Zologa. Zologa. Recovering from back surgery. Have you ever had her hand raised? Oh, Karen. Hi, this is my sister. Anybody else? Yeah, my uncle Jack, who um, has <coughs> had back surgery and has um, uh, a bone disease, uh, bone cancer, uh, he's in recovery, doing well uh, in a more bone cancer hospital. Thank you. Thank you. Not that I'd like to begin our time of prayer as I often do with a reading. Uh, this is a prayer. I may have heard it before, I don't know. It's been around a while. It's attributed to a 17th century, 1600s, 17th century nun. She prays Lord, you know better than I know myself that I am getting older and will someday be old. Keep me from getting talkative and particularly from the fatal habit of thinking that I must say something on every subject and on every occasion. Release me from craving to straighten out everybody's affairs. Make me thoughtful, but not moody. Helpful, but not bossy. With my vast store of wisdom, it seems a pity not to use it all. But you know, Lord, that I want a few friends at the end. Keep my mind from the recital of endless details. Give me wings to come to the point. I ask for grace enough to listen to the tales of others' pains, but seal my lips from my own aches and pains. They are increasing, and my love of rehearsing them is becoming sweeter as the years go by. Help me to endure them with patience. I dare not ask for improved memory but for a growing humility and a lessening cocksureness when my memory seems to clash with the memory of others. Teach me the glorious lesson that occasionally it is possible that I may be mistaken. Keep me reasonably sweet. I do not want to be a saint. Some of them are so hard to live with. But a sourpuss is one of the crowning works of the devil. Give me the ability to see good things in unexpected places and talents in unexpected people. And give me, O oh Lord, the grace to tell them so. Amen. And now let us join in prayer. O God of all creation, Lord of love, we come to you in prayer because you alone are our source of power. And because we know that you alone are all goodness, all wisdom, and all power. As we celebrate President's Day as a nation tomorrow, help us all to reflect on how fortunate we have been as a nation to have had such excellent presidents as George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, who always kept the welfare of all the people of our nation their agenda. We pray for our nation at this time, O oh God as it works its way through a period of transition in leadership, always a time when nerves can be on edge and misunderstandings arise. We pray for those in positions of leadership that they might hear, understand, and respond to the needs and concerns of the American people. All of those who make up our nation, 
at this time, and that they may seek and receive your guidance and strength to do what is best. Here are prayers for those who are marginalized and for those who are experiencing fear and uncertainty for any reason at this time. We pray for those who are victims of war and violence and for those who seek to help them. We pray for those for whom food and shelter are not a given and who live in dread of having to provide for their own needs and the needs of their children each day. Lord, we pray for peace in the Middle East and throughout the whole world. And God, hear our prayers for those on our prayer list and those whose names we mentioned aloud here today, as well as those we hold in our own hearts and minds at this time. And finally, Lord, we pray for ourselves. Give us the strength to do the things we know you would have us to do, today and each moment of every day. All these things we lift up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> this time, we will have our dedication of the tithe and offerings and start with the minute for mission.
and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. Being nice is one thing, but if you actually try to, to do this stuff in real life, day after day, what kind of life do you think you'd end up with? Jesus probably should have put a disclaimer at the end of this passage, like they do on the TV ads sometimes. Don't, do not try this at all. <laughs> well, actually, I know of two seminary students way back when I was in the seminary who, for a full week, one week, determined to do their best to live literally according to the Sermon on the Mount, including even these ridiculous rules. Both of them did lose their coat. <laughs> as well as, as most of the little bit of money they had. But believe it or not, after that week in which they both survived, they wrote about it and claimed that it was one of the happiest weeks of their lives. <clears throat> it drove their wives crazy. <laughs> I mean, here they were working extra jobs to earn extra money so their husbands could go to seminary, and here they were out there giving it away. No wonder Jesus doesn't have a paragraph in the Sermon on the Mount about how to have a happy marriage. <laughs> I said it before, and I'll probably say it again, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is not talking about life in this world. Actions as they can be seen and recorded on a video camera. Although you and I live every single minute of every day of our lives right here in this world. The world of people and things and places and events. Jesus assumes that you and I know that life is more complex than that. He assumes we know that although we do live in this world all the time, we also live in what A. Richard Niebuhr called the other world in the midst of this world. It's sometimes referred to as the kingdom of heaven or the spiritual life, or the inner life. It's not physically visible uh, the same way that your body and the cubes that you're sitting on are. But it is every bit as real. It's the world of your thoughts and your feelings, your memory, your imagination, and your anticipation of the future. It's your hopes your dreams, your fears, your ideals, your principles, and everything that motivates you and shapes your behavior and your words in this world. What you say and what you do and how you respond to others and to situations. How we live in this world our behavior in the concrete world of people, events, and places around us is very, very important to Jesus. However, he knows that the key to changing our behavior is not found in a set of rules and regulations about how to behave in this world. That's where the Old Testament came up short, and he knew that. He knows that what drives and shapes the way we behave in this world is who we are on the inside, in the other world. So that's the focus of the entire Sermon on the Mount. Just look, for example, at the second paragraph of this passage. You have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. 
For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. <laughs> Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, on the one hand, I want to say, well, it's poor. Why didn't he just come out and say it at the beginning? That's what he's trying to, been trying to say all along, isn't it? Be perfect. Just exactly like God is perfect. Love with God's love, and you will be perfect. It's as simple as that. But, on the other hand, when I hear that, I want to say, well, let's just forget the whole thing. <laughs> because there's no way that I can even imagine myself being perfect, much less ever thinking I could be. When I find myself thinking like that, of course, I'm simply following the crown. Am I not? For our society in general, since all it focuses on is this world of the five senses, knows that perfection does not exist. Which it does in this world. And so all of our cultural beliefs and sayings are about perfection. They make fun of it. And they turn it into something undesirable. Stephen Maine wrote an entire book called Be a Perfect Person in Just Three Days <laughs> to deal with how ridiculous it is to even think about perfection in this world. He says, Congratulations! You're not perfect. It's ridiculous to want to be perfect anyway. But then everybody's ridiculous sometimes, except perfect people. <laughs> you know what perfect is. Perfect is not eating or drinking or talking or moving a muscle or making even the teeniest mistake. Perfect is never doing anything wrong, which means never doing anything at all. Perfect is bored. So, you're not perfect. Wonderful. Have fun. Eat things that give you bad breath. Trip over your own shoelaces. Laugh. Let someone else laugh at you. Perfect people never do any of those things. All they do is sit around and sip wheat tea and think about how perfect they are. But they're not really 100% perfect anyway. You should see them when they get the hiccups. Who? Who needs you can drink pickle juice and imitate gorillas and do silly dances and sing stupid songs and wear funny hats and be as imperfect as you please and still be a good person. Good people are hard to find anyway. And they're a lot more fun than perfect people any day of the week. Virtually all of the worldly wisdom that I'm aware of tells us to forget about this, this whole idea of perfection, that it's not even a virtue to be sought, which is true when you're talking about this world. Listen to some of this worldly wisdom from Durkin. Certain flaws are necessary to the whole. It would seem strange if old friends lack certain quirks, or from a popular sense. No one is perfect. That's why pencils have erasers. And while you've heard the saying, practice makes perfect, my wife informs me that musicians are more fond of saying, practice makes better. <laughs> or from Leonard Cohen, ring the bell that still can ring, forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Or, from a Chinese proverb, gold cannot be poor, and people cannot be perfect. But my personal favorite is 
what my brother-in-law said to his fourth grade teacher one day. He was, he was always talking back and coming out with wisecracks all the time. And finally, one day, his teacher, exasperated, said to him, Carlton, you are a perfect idiot! <laughs> <laughs> to which he immediately responded, Oh, no man, no one's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> the Greek word that is translated perfect in the Sermon on the Mount is teleos, teleos, which means complete, finished, mature, fully developed, having achieved its purpose or goal. So, of course, there's no such thing as a perfect anything in this world. But Jesus is not speaking in the Sermon on the Mount simply about this world. He's speaking about that which motivates us and shapes our actions and behaviors in this world. He's speaking about that which is already at the center of who we are as human beings, which is love. And not just any love, but God's love, which is perfect love. When he says to be perfect, he's urging us to simply become who we already are at the very deepest center of ourselves. To allow that perfect love of God to flow through our thoughts and our feelings, our words, and our actions. But of course, we will never be able to do this with anything even approaching perfection. Why? Because perfect, the perfect love of God within us is not the only thing that is within us, is it? <clears throat> the perfect love of God which is in us does love every human being equally, no matter how much, how we think about them, how much we like or dislike them. There are also, however, all kinds of other things within us. There are self-centered desires, anxious fears, egoistic ambitions, and hurtful resentments, small-minded temptations. Look at those who made it to the semifinals of the Australian Open Tennis Tournament last month, for example. Now, whether you're talking about those who actually made it to the finals, like Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal, Venus, and Serena Williams, or whether you're talking about the all made it to the semifinals, like Bob Rinka, Dimitrov, and Vanderweg, who have the ability, but for some reason failed in the semifinals to do what they knew perfectly well how to do. These athletes know what these dynamics of inner and outer perfection are all about. And it certainly doesn't keep them from continuing to strive for perfection. So their bodies and their muscles and their brains know perfectly well how to execute that shot that they want to make. But especially when they're in the spotlight of the center court and a major tournament, other things are at work within them keeping them from allowing this perfection to manifest itself in their outward performance. Those same dynamics are at work within you and me all the time, aren't they? We know, we do. We know how to be kind and thoughtful and generous and forgiving. We know that we should always love those with whom we are speaking, no matter how we feel about them or how they feel about us. We know we are capable of compassion and even self-sacrifice. Why is it then 
that our thoughts and our emotional reactions, much less our words and our actions, seldom manifest these qualities of God's love in our day-to-day living. And so Jesus came and preached the Sermon on the Mount. And I believe he preached it every day, everywhere he went. approximate the kingdom of heaven. We must change our own hearts if we want to change our real behavior. For our real behavior consists not of the words that we say and the actions that we do, but the spirit in which we say them and do them. I pray not that you will ever become perfect in this world, but that you will learn to discover and make use of God's love, which is already implanted firmly within you. My prayer for each of you throughout this coming year, as well as for the whole congregation as a whole, is that you will learn to truly trust in faith what you already do know, and to let go of your willfulness and to open yourself in willingness to the love of God in Christ that is already perfectly implanted within you. For Christ is in us, and we are in Him. We are well off in God, the Almighty, in God's holiness, all of us. Amen.